Welcome. Lovely to have you here. Uh, my name is David Catney. I'm the director of the Centre for Strategic Studies here at Victoria University. Uh, and on behalf of the Centre and the University, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you along to this uh, panel discussion this evening on New Zealand-United States relations in a changing world. Uh, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Centre for Strategic Studies. Uh, it's very nice to look out the audience and see some former directors uh, in, in the audience. Uh, and one of the things that we're absolutely delighted about uh, in this our anniversary year is to have the chance to partner with uh, one of the world's leading think tanks, the Centre for Strategic and International Studies uh, in Washington, uh, with the support of the State Department, to um, host some uh, leading US think tankers here in Wellington in New Zealand. And over the last day and a half in Auckland, about 40 participants from the United States and from New Zealand have been tackling a really wide range of issues from the state of our bilateral relationship, uh, risks and opportunities in regional security, challenges uh, to regional and global trade and trade architecture, as well as a whole host of non-traditional policy challenges uh, in the South Pacific. Uh, and I think it would be fair to say that it was a, a free and frank exchange in the very best traditions of that, and that there were plenty of things that we agreed on, and there were some things where I think there were some, some disagreements and some, or some points of, of, of difference. And I won't go over all of the findings, uh, although a report will come out of, this, uh, out, of, out of these discussions, but to give you a bit of a flavor of them, at the end of today, one person present commented that he preferred to describe the current situation as a, quote, dynamic environment rather than a cataclysmic one. <laughs> but one of the things I think that we, um, everyone at the meeting agreed on was that this is a really very, very important time for both New Zealand and the United States to be talking openly about what our policy settings are on a wide range of issues and what these mean for our most important relationships uh, in the region. And for that reason, we're absolutely delighted to welcome three leading figures from uh, the Centre for Strategic and International Studies to Wellington to share their views on US policy settings and some of the discussions and some of the findings that came out of the talks over the last um, day and a half, at least from the United States or from a CSIS perspective, and what these, some of these issues might mean for uh, New Zealand US relations. So I'm very pleased to introduce um, from left to right Dr. Amy Seawright, who is Senior Advisor and Director of the Southeast Asia Program at the CSIS. Uh, Amy most recently, before taking on her present role at CSIS, served at, uh, as the, um, in the Department of Defense as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia. Next to her is uh, Andrew Shearer. Andrew joined CSIS in 2016 as Senior Advisor on Asia Pacific Security. And Andrew also directs the new CSIS project on alliances and American leadership. And as you'll be able to tell when Andrew speaks, by the way, that as he put it, he speaks his vowels clearly. Uh, he's an Australian. Thank you, correctly. And uh, Andrew was formerly National Security Advisor to Prime Minister John Howard and Prime Minister Tony Abbott. And to my immediate left is Dr. Zach Cooper. Zach is Senior Fellow for Asian Security at CSIS. His research has appeared in leading academic and policy journals, including International Security, Security Studies, and the Washington Quarterly. And before joining CSIS, uh, he served uh, among his various positions in the White House uh, and in the Pentagon. So we're enormously fortunate to have three really leading figures who can uh, shed light on some of the, the questions around US policy settings that are very much in play at the moment. Uh, and I'm also pleased to say that it's going to be a very interactive format this evening. And you'll notice that there are these instructions up on the, on the, on the big board behind me. And if you haven't already, uh, if you uh, have a, a smartphone, I don't know, do, do people still call them smartphones or just phones? Um, if you have a phone, if you could please log on to, um, to that address. It will allow you to take part in some interactive polling which our panelists are going to be putting to you uh, over the course of the evening. Uh, so you don't need to log on to the VIC Wi-Fi, you can just do it through, through data. Um, so please log on if you haven't done it already, and that will give you a chance to participate a little more fully in, in this evening's uh, interactive discussion. But that's enough for me, and with, um, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to ask Andrew Shearer to make some opening remarks. Andrew. 
Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to the Centre for Strategic Studies for uh, hosting us this evening, but also for partnering with us in the conference that we jointly hosted in Portland over the last two days. And um, that, for me, was fascinating. Um, and one of the things we'd like to do, seeing we've been talking for the last two days, is to involve you uh, in, in uh, our proceedings this evening through this polling technology, which uh, we use quite a lot at CSIS, and we find it's a great way to engage people. Um, sometimes we find it tends to confirm our thoughts about uh, public opinion and, and, and issues and priorities, but sometimes it's rather surprising. And um, uh, I think uh, generally our experience is that the surprising results are the interesting ones, and that's what we'd like to to test with you. So what we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to make some quick introductory remarks which are really our impressions from the conference of the last couple of days. And then we're going to put up some questions in, in three batches of three. Uh, we're going to get you to vote on those, uh, those questions. We'll leave the voting open for about a couple of minutes, I think, um, uh, for each group of three. But after you've voted on three, we'll take a look at the results together uh, and then, uh, as a panel, we'll, we'll, com we'll give some commentary on, on the results, and hopefully we'll be able to open that up to a discussion with our audience. Um, because I've got the funny accent and I'm the only one up here, I think, without a doctorate, which makes me singularly unqualified, uh, I've drawn a short, short straw, um, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, if you like, kind of three gorillas that were in the room for most of our proceedings of the last two days in Auckland, um, three, three major issues that, um, that we were able to talk about in a very frank way. And that's one of the great things as a former government official. Uh, it's really nice to be in a second track format, a, a non-government uh, format, where you can really talk very frankly together uh, about issues. Um, and I guess it's because I'm a non-American here. Um, I'm the one who's going to do what? Uh, there's a new verb for this in, in the US, in Washington. I'm going to do some Trump's plan. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the biggest gorillas in the room for the last couple of days. And that is just to give you some very brief introductory remarks. Um, hopefully a little bit of context about the Trump administration, the advent of of this rather extraordinary um, administration, this, this period we're going through. And then I'm going to um, pass over to, to Amy and Zach to, to add some thoughts. So um, I think it's fair to say that in the, in the frankness of a second track uh, forum with a lot of smart people from, from New Zealand and the United States uh, around the table, there was a very high degree of concern about President Trump, his temperament, some of his policies, and the fact that really for the first time since the Second World War, we've got a president in the United States without a deep and abiding commitment to what, um, what uh, we uh, international relations wants, like to call the liberal world order, or the rules-based international order. There are all these formulations. Uh, but a president who, uh, who doesn't um, uh, overtly proclaim naturally anyway the value of alliances to the United States, uh, who doesn't naturally, I think it's fair to say, um, uh, proclaim the benefits of free trade and talks much more about fair trade and reciprocal trade. Uh, a president who, um, who does, um, and, and uh, as a non-American who was at the inaugural address, who doesn't um, talk about American leadership in values terms, in ideational terms, in a way that just about, again, every uh, American president, certainly since the Second World War, whether Democrat or Republican, has done so. And how, how should we think about that? Now, um, one participant in the, um, in the conference that we've just held talked about Trump derangement syndrome, um, which I guess is TDS. Uh, and I think um, one of the things I've tried to do in the last couple of years as I've tried to make sense of this, along with everyone else, is to avoid TDS. Uh, because TDS doesn't really help. You can sort of walk around, run around, waving your hands and, and um, pronouncing that the world's about to end. Uh, it probably isn't. If you take a longer historical sweep, I think what you can see is that while there are aspects of the president's uh, temperament, as I said, that many of us feel fine 
deeply disquieting while there are aspects of his policies, whether they're on climate change, which has come up a lot, or, um, or North Korea, where we've had this kind of veering from, you know, oh my God, the Americans are about to attack North Korea, to oh my God, the Americans are about to talk to North, North Korea. Um, uh, on a whole range of issues, there are, there are obviously things to make allies of the United States, partners of the United States, and long-standing friends like New Zealand uncomfortable. There are also some elements of, of deep continuity in US policy uh, under, the, under the Trump administration, and we could, I, I think, usefully perhaps talk about some of those in response to the questions. Um, so a lot of the discussion in the in the conference was really about how do we kind of work through this period, uh, how do we uh, deal with a president who uh, came to office, um, I, in my view, as, as a response to a set of very deep economic and social trends in the United States, um, uh, who, who really reflects a disruption in the force, if you like, uh, and is certainly in office, obviously, uh, as, uh, uh, a source of some disruption, but needs to be understood in a broader uh, American um, economic, social, and political context. How do we how do we think about that? How do we navigate this period? How do we engage the president? How do we reach out to other uh, elements in the United States? Because, of course, and again, this was a theme that I think came through the the discussion strongly. There's much more to America than than the president, wherever the president is. Uh, it's a system of checks and balances. There's a Congress with strong interests in foreign policy and national security. Uh, there's a there's a, a vast uh, population, a whole range of different views, obviously. Uh, and uh, I think, as, as at least one person said today, you know, this too will pass. Uh, so, so I think those were some of the kind of the themes that came out. We did manage to go beyond the hand waving um, kind of TDS phase. Uh, and I think we, we did get into some very constructive discussion about the role of civil society, uh, the private sector in building strong relations between New Zealand and the United States. We shouldn't just think constantly of government to government, executive to executive relations. There's a whole lot of strands to this relationship. There's a whole lot of opportunities to work closely together um, to, um, whether it's to increase prosperity, jobs, growth, for our future populations or security in the region. So um, that, I think, was the sort of uplifting uh, part of the last the last couple of days that I took away. I'll leave it there and hand over to Amy. Thank you, Andrew. So um, I'm going to talk about the second gorilla in the room during the conference, or dragon in the room, uh, which was China. And certainly, it was no surprise, certainly to the American participants, that China would be a very large topic of discussion as we discussed, you know, we were really talking about US-New Zealand relations on the strategic side, the security side, the economic side. Um, and, and so we certainly expected that ch the role of China in, uh, in shaping our, um, uh, our environment within which we, we make a lot of choices in those areas, certainly no surprise that China was going to play a major role. But I think there was, um, Perhaps a bit of surprise about the degree of divergence. Certainly, the initial uh, uh, discussions that we had about China revealed uh, quite different conceptualizations of China's role and uh, what what kind of um, risk or opportunity China posed. Um, you know, this is actually the third conference uh, that we've done that has been somewhat similar in format. The first one we focused on uh, U.S. ASEAN relations. We invited a lot of ASEAN country experts, or, or experts from ASEAN countries to Manila, which was chair at the time, chair of ASEAN, and we talked about U.S.-ASEAN relations and regional dynamics. And then last summer, we, um, our summer, last August, we held a conference in Australia, in Sydney, and talked about the U.S.-Australia alliance. Um, and so this is our third one, talking about U.S.-New Zealand Pacific Partnership. Um, China dominated at all three discussions. Uh, so again, from the U.S. perspective, from our perspective, it wasn't a surprise that China dominated the way it did. But what surprised the American participants, I think, was the way that our New Zealand counterparts were thinking about China 
as one that, you know, first of all, they really, you know, no one had any appetite to want to choose between a close relationship with the United States and a close relationship with China. Um, there's relative optimism about ch China's trajectory and the role that it was playing in the region and globally. Um, and just a sense that there wasn't really sharp trade-offs that had to be grappled with. Um, and that surprised uh, some of us because, you know, as I said, we were in Australia where there's a very different view among many people, many strategic thinkers in Australia think about China very differently than a lot of American strategic thinkers do. But they're, they think of it as a very sharp set of choices that they have to make. Um, and, and they've really thought through the trade-offs. And I would say the ASEAN conference revealed the same kind of thing. Of course, uh, Southeast Asian countries will very often say, we do not want to be forced to have to choose between the United States and China. But when you get into discussions about where they want the region to go, what kind of developments uh, they want to see, what kind of, you know, how important the rules-based order is to them, they're pretty clear-eyed about the, the fact that they really want the United States to stay engaged and, and uphold this rules-based order, and, and they have real concerns about China in some dimensions. So this was interesting because it was a little, it was a little, you know, less, uh, as I said, more optimistic about the role of China, um, and, and, and not really seeing um, the same kind of sharp trade-offs that many others in the region do, and certainly that Americans do. And then from the United, from the New Zealand perspective, I think there was a lot of surprise at how uh, harsh the view from American participants was on China um, and how sort of hawkish and um, uh, pessimistic it was about China's trajectory and, and the importance of kind of addressing that issue head on. Um, there was, I think, an expectation that was expressed by several participants that, you know, we knew that there were a lot of hawks on China in Washington. Um, but we didn't expect to hear such unanimity. You know, we thought there was a diverse range of opinions on China, some who really favor and advocate cooperation, and some who talk about competition and strategic rivalry. But the, all of the American participants, with the exception of some of the next generation of participants that we had, and, and Zach will talk about them, um, but all the American um, think tank participants were, were pretty unified in having a pretty pessimistic view about China. And so, uh, you know, I think it was uh, an opportunity for us to explain that actually in Washington, the consensus on China has really moved in the last three years. Um, you know, from one that where there was a broad consensus, not universal, but there was a broad middle mainstream sort of consensus that China um, was a rising power that um, should be engaged and cooperated with and brought into global and regional uh, organizations, regimes. So, you know, China was invited into the WTO in the midst of the financial crisis in 2007-2008. The G20 was created with China right at the center. China's brought into APEC before that. China's brought into a lot of the, the regional organizations and the idea, it, you know, at the time under the George W. Bush administration was, we really want to engage China, bring it into the international, you know, the international regimes that help govern economics and security affairs. And over time, China will then become a responsible stakeholder and will help to support this rules-based order that has been beneficial to everyone, including China. Um, and you know, when the Obama administration came in, and uh, you know, President Obama determined that. The United States' core long-term interests were in Asia Pacific, and yet we were, the United States had been continually bogged down in conflicts in the Middle East and terrorism and other issues. And so he launched the pivot or the rebalance to really try to refocus U.S. engagement in the region. And there was a lot of early concern expressed by China and others that this was an attempt to contain China. And at the time, I was, I, was, I was part of some of these early efforts to launch the rebalance. Um, so I can tell you that there was a lot of sincerity when Obama administration officials would go around the region and talk to China and say, this is not about containing China. This really isn't about China. This is about the United States wanting to be more focused and engaged in the region because we have learned the lesson that you have to show up in the region in order to really be 
uh, in order to build uh, uh, engagement and stronger ties and our economic future, our security future, um, you know, the future of the world really is going to be written in Asia, and the United States wants to be a part of that. Over time, however, um, because through Chinese behavior, particularly in the South China Sea, but in other domains like cyber and economic frustrations, um, there was a growing frustration and concern and a sense that uh, China was actually moving in a, in a different direction than what was hoped. Um, and so it had to be addressed directly um, in order to maintain this rules-based order that there was sort of growing evidence that Xi Jinping wanted to chip away at that and build a, an order that, was, uh, that, was, that, that would sort of push the United States out of the region a little bit and, and, and an order that was very China-centric and um, geared towards China, in mean, deference to China, basically China's interests. Uh, rather than uh, a more kind of open, inclusive, transparent, multilateral order. So there's been so there already in the end of the Obama administration, uh, there was a real shift um, among many different sectors. Um, it was it was policymakers, you know, uh, like, like me in the Pentagon and my colleagues, but across the different agencies as well. It was think tanks, academics. Um, that were looking at this and, and growing more concerned. And it was the business community that became really frustrated after repeatedly trying, you know, hearing about the reforms that China was going to take to open up its market. And in fact, there was more and more evidence that China was actually moving in the opposite direction. So it, the, there was a real convergence of views that, you know, China is um, something that really needs to be addressed. And then President Trump was elected, and of course we started to see some of the really tough measures that, is, that are being taken on the economic side, um, and we can talk about it, but, the, but what the American participants really try to explain to our New Zealand counterparts is, this is, you know, the, the, the reason why there was this shift in American expert opinion, and the broad base of that shift, the real kind of consensus that's emerged, and I think that was quite surprising to our Kiwi counterparts. So it was a very interesting discussion. I think we did manage to close the divergence a little bit towards the end, but um, I think it was uh, very revelatory for both sides. Let me turn to Zach, who's going to talk about uh, some of the next generation participants. Well, thank you, Amy, and uh, thank you, David, for having us here. It's wonderful to be in New Zealand. I, I want to build on the two gorillas, as we call them, uh, and, and ask, where do we go from here uh, as, a, as a relationship, as a partnership? How do we move past these issues? I think there's no question that um, Trump and China are going to be two real issues. Often when we talk about relationships, we talk about them being bound by interests and by values. And the challenge here is that when you talk about interests, I think there's a sense that they might be diverging a bit on China between the United States and New Zealand. And when you talk about values, there's certainly a sense that they're diverging a bit as US and so. There's a concern, I think, here, which, which is understandable, that um, interests and values are somewhat uh, diverged and that, that could get worse. And there's some questions about where do we go from here as a result. So I think the first danger is it, it, it's very easy to focus on what we can't do at the moment, right? And, and the list is long. Uh, the United States is not going to enter TPP uh, in the next year or two. I think we would love for that to happen, but it's, it won't happen. Um, you're probably not going to hear President Trump talk a lot about U.S. values in the region. That's, that's not, probably not going to happen. Uh, tariffs on steel and aluminum are going to be a challenge. You won't hear much about climate change. Uh, and you will hear some words about alliances and partnerships that are concerning, uh, including for Americans. So it's easy to focus on those things that we can't do and the problems in the relationship. But I think that the real question, and this is where young leaders help to push us forward, is what can we do? And I, I think actually there's a lot. Um, so let me just give you a good example that came up from one of the young leaders today, which is obviously President Trump is not huge on climate change research, but if you look at the state of California in the United States, they're going forward with the US uh, agreement and the Paris Climate Agreement. So, um, and they're not the only state in the US that are, that's doing that. So there's actually a lot of cooperation that can happen below the federal level in our government with states on these kinds of key issues. And it might not be ideal, but that's what we're going to have to do in the, in the years ahead. 
Uh, another area is expanding cooperation in the Pacific Islands. I think there's a lot that can be done there. Another is helping us to understand what this Indo-Pacific strategy should be. Uh, we've announced that the US government has that we're going to have this free and open Indo-Pacific approach. We don't quite know exactly what that means yet, so we need help to define it. And then I'd say the last thing is that we need friends like New Zealand to sometimes say how it treats us about what they want us to stand for and what we have stood for in the past and what we should stand for in the future. And I know those may be difficult conversations, but I think they're important. And I think that's part of what makes our relationship important. Um, and so I hope that friends here will be willing to say things even if they're tough and they may not be received well uh, at the minute, but we'll remember that you were there and reminded us of who we were and who we are and who we should be. Um, so I, I wanted to just lay out four possible options for where I think New Zealand might go, and, and then this I think leads into the, the questions that we're going to put up on the screen. And there really are four strategic options in my view that for New Zealand in dealing with this new strategic relationship. One is to anchor itself even more closely in the U.S. Uh, partnership. I don't get the sense that that's where things are going at the moment, but I think a lot of Americans would like to see that. A second option is uh, not anchoring, but what I would call augmenting. Uh, finding other states that New Zealand can work with to reinforce this order that we've created. Uh, a third option would be what I would call autonomizing. This is basically a form of de-alignment. So you choose autonomy over alignment. You are not as beholden to the United States or to other countries in the region. And the last option is to basically accommodate. And here I'm talking about China. And I mean, uh, provide China not just more room to do what it would like, but in some cases, probably reference Chinese uh, views over American and other views of what should happen in the region. I think those are four fairly stark choices. And I'm very interested to see out of the question and answer and, and the questions we're about to put on the screen, which direction you all think New Zealand is going and where you think New Zealand should go. So with that, uh, we'll hand it back over to David. Thank you very much, Zach. So I think, Sam, if we can put the first question on. Three or first three. This one is three. And if you can, if you have a phone that is locked on, you should be able to see that unlocked questions. <clears throat> you should be able to see all of them on your phone, but we'll only be able to display one at a time on the screen. Everybody see those? Yeah. So if you could um, have a look at the question that you can see and indicate a vote. Time's running out, so make your vote. Um, including about apples kind of gels or, or not with 
some of our discussion at the conference. I mean, to me, um, looking at these results, what's really interesting is, and, and Zach touched on this, that the amalgam of values and interests that underpin the relationship. Um, and what, what I see... Oh. oh, sorry, you can't. You can't. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you the results very quickly. So, 15% uh, of respondents uh, nominated the trust between political leaders is the most important factor in the relationship. 31% identified free and open trade. 14% identified cooperation on non-traditional security issues. And the largest result, 40%, identified cooperation on issues important to the Southern Pacific. So, to me, the interesting thing, just building on Zach's comments, is that these results suggest, at least to me, an ability on the part of, uh, of our audience to distinguish uh, views about President Trump, his disruptiveness, uh, his destabilising effects, and actually to, 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 to narrow in on New Zealand's interests in quite a, quite a stark way. And uh, the focus on the South Pacific and trade, to me, makes eminent sense uh, for a New Zealand audience. So, so that, to me, is um, is the striking thing, and and somewhat reassuring for the kind of framework that I think Zach's indicated for the relationship. So let's uh, let's go to the second set of results. Okay, so for those of you who can't see, uh, this is the question in 10 years, the most powerful country in Asia will be, and the choices are the United States, China, Japan, India, Indonesia. Um, China won overwhelmingly your votes, 74% uh, of respondents thought that China would be the most powerful nation in Asia. The United States came in second with 13%, followed by India, 8% and Japan and Indonesia each had 2%. Um, in a way, this isn't surprising. Um, there's certainly uh, a consensus view, not just in, in New Zealand, but in the region, that China is, is rising very rapidly to, to regional, perhaps regional preeminence. Um, I would think that if this, was, if this poll was taken in the United States or many other countries in the region, like Japan, uh, uh, Australia, I think perhaps, you would see a larger, you'd still see a lot of uh, uh, thinking that China would be the, uh, the most powerful, but I think you'd see a larger uh, percentage going for the United States retaining dominance, um, or how, how do we phrase it, the most power, you know, retaining predominance. Um, the United, and, and really for two reasons, one is that, you know, the, the United States uh, has such a broad, um, uh, basis for its dominant pre preeminence. Uh, there's a lot of hard power and soft power, economics, you know, military, um, innovation, uh, a, a whole range of areas. So, you know, someone at the conference said, you know, you don't lose that kind of power overnight. In fact, it was quite interesting. There was a New Zealand participant who remarked at how kind of gloomy many of the Americans seemed about kind of what kind of where we were headed. Uh, and, you know, his perspective was, um, you know, the United States has been in, uh, in, in, in the leadership position for so long, has incredible convening uh, power, and um, uh, as well as, you know, a con a inducement power. Um, and so, you know, we should have a little more confidence that, uh, that the United States would maintain that kind of leadership over time, even at a time where many of us are a little bit confused about where our country is going under, you know, we were surprised by President Trump's election. We were, we we're all kind of confused and befuddled about some of the direction that his administration is, is taken. Um, so that's quite interesting. The other thing I would just point out is that when we did this poll in uh, Australia with a number of students at the University of Sydney, um, we were surprised that, they, that so many of them chose India. It was a 
pretty high percentage. I mean, it's not as high as China, um, but it was, uh, I believe it was in the 20s or 30s or something. And so they were certainly thinking about India rising um, in a way that isn't reflected here, and that might be uh, geographic uh, di different uh, distance proximity, or it could be other, other things as well. I'm just going to add two points. Uh, the first is we've asked this question to folks you know, around the region, and one of the most interesting results to me was uh, if you ask this question in Japan, you actually get a majority of people saying that they think the United States will be more powerful in 10 years than in China, which is really a fascinating result in a lot of ways. Um, and, and one that you know, I, I'm not sure I agree with, but uh, it's interesting that countries so close to China see it that way. And I, I think the reason is that um, if you're Japan, you look at the region and you're not really thinking just about China or the United States. You're really thinking about the United States aligned with some of the countries in the region, right? Whether it's Japan or South Korea or Australia to some extent. Um, and so you're not necessarily thinking about the power of a single country. You're thinking in, in some ways about the blocks. Um, and I don't think that kind of thinking is sort of permeates uh, in New Zealand, which, I, which is interesting. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is that when we've done these polls, the numbers have changed rapidly. And I, I think Donald Trump has a lot to do with, uh, with this result. Um, the view, right, that this is sort of a declining United States, lashing out a bit. Um, and, and so I'd be interested if we were to do this uh, poll again in a few years to see what any of the results might change a bit. Just add one very quick thought, and that is I think that um, results to on this question in Australia and I suspect New Zealand are kind of um, skewed, I think, because we look at the relationship through the lens of China's economic importance to us, and that's actually a slightly different point than whether or not China's the most powerful country in the region. But certainly over the last you know, 10 years in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same here, the business papers are full of reporting on China, and frankly, most of the newspapers in different ways, whether it's Chinese political interference or, you know, goings on in the Chinese economy and trading relationship. It looms so large for all of us economically, but I think it does tend to distort this. Uh, and I think if you look at all the indices of, of power, um, military, diplomatic, um, economic, yes, uh, but also soft power, where I see China on a much more illiberal trajectory, um, then I think the equation starts to look a bit different from, from this result. And so the third question is, where should New Zealand contribute to military operations with the United States? And the uh, overwhelming response is about half of the participants said the region is unimportant if there is a UN mandate, which is a really fascinating result. Um, and the, the next, uh, at 24%, is only near New Zealand, including in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. Uh, then the next two are about tied globally, including the Middle East, and should not contribute at all. And then finally, uh, only in Asia, including Northeast Asia. So I, I, I think this reflects something you're seeing throughout the region, which is whenever we talk about uh, alliances or partnerships, we often talk about the twin uh, dangers in those relationships of entrapment and abandonment, right? Entrapment where a country gets drawn into a war that they didn't want to fight by their ally or partner, and abandonment where they think they have an agreement to stand alongside each other, and then uh, they get into a, a crisis, and they find out that actually their ally or partner isn't going to be there for them. And I think what this reflects is that there's a growing fear in the region about uh, entrapped by the United States, right? By a risk-taking leader, Donald Trump. Uh, not, you know, maybe, I think some of this is probably a reaction to the concern about a uh, potential conflict in Korea, and that's why I think you see so little support for uh, engagement in Northeast Asia, but maybe also concern about Taiwan uh, and then a China scenario. Um, and, and this is something we're seeing across the region this growing concern about entrapment. What's new and I think what's really interesting is that for the first time uh, in, in recent memory at least, we're seeing concern not just about entrapment, 
but also about abandonment at the same time, right? So countries uh, are often worried that the U.S. is going to sort of leave them. Uh, and you don't often see that they're worried both that the U.S. is going to drag them into a war and leave them if one were to occur. That's usually one or the other. And I think you're seeing a bit of both with these results. Just while we're doing that, just a quick comment on that last point, because I think it's, it's quite interesting. I think that um, these notions of um, entrapment and abandonment probably a little sharp edged in the context of the New Zealand case not being a, not being an ally and being somewhat detached from some of the more pressing security dilemmas in, in East Asia. Um, certainly I think the UN, um, the high percentage around the UN vote would reflect a long standing New Zealand commitment to multilateralism. Uh, and perhaps would be in the context of the US relationship would also flow out of the Iraq invasion in two thousand two, which of course because of the Panama mandate was, um, was uh, but uh, certainly rather than perhaps entrapment or um, abandonment, it's, uh, certainly there's that, that one, that very strong interest in maintaining, I think, a US engagement in the region. But anyway, three more questions. And please exercise your votes. Okay, so um, again, I'll just, I'll just um, quickly read the results so everyone knows what they are. Um, the question is about um, recent reports regarding Chinese influence in New Zealand politics. Um, the results, the, the first answer is uh, yes, I'm concerned and I think the current laws need strengthening, 36%. Yes, and I think the current laws are sufficient to manage the issue, 6%. Um, I am concerned but I'm sure whether action needs to be taken, 38%. Uh, and then the two negative answers, no, there's no firm evidence of wrongdoing, it's 10%, and no, this is a beat up, 10%. Uh, to me, what's interesting is that uh, this issue has been live in Australia for uh, about the last 18 months. There have been some high profile media reports, um, uh, episode involving Senator Sam Dastiari, a high profile Labor senator who got kind of tangled up with uh, Chinese money and, and um, suffered a big penalty as a result of that. So, so it's interesting to me that the level of concern here in New Zealand is quite as high as it is because my sense and I think our sense from the conference was that while this was coming onto the agenda in New Zealand, it, it wasn't quite um, the hot button issue that it seems to be certainly with this audience now. This may be a slightly skewed sample. You're kind of self-selecting, I guess, in that you're here, uh, presumably, because you're interested about foreign affairs and, uh, and security issues. But nonetheless, uh, I find it quite, quite striking. Um, and I'm also quite struck by the fact that there's, uh, there's a very low level of confidence that the existing legal framework here in New Zealand is adequate to the task. Now, in an Australian context, I'm absolutely certain the existing laws are not strong enough because what we're dealing with, it's become apparent, is a global uh, uh, strategy uh, directed from Beijing uh, to certainly exert influence, and um, there's nothing wrong with that, all countries exert influence, but uh, to go over that line into uh, political interference and uh, our colleague John Garno, who's done a lot of work on this uh, in an Australian context, would say that what distinguishes political interference is activity that is uh, uh, clandestine, covert, um, or, or corrupt, or coercive. You know, those three characteristics take, um, take a state's behaviour into an unacceptable place that should be troubling. And we see manifestations of this in Australia, uh, in the political system, at the federal level, at the state level, and even at the local government level. We've seen it uh, in our higher education sector, where there's a very high dependence on uh, China as a market for students, but also as a source of research funding. Uh, we've seen it in the uh, Chinese language media, where there's a very high degree of control uh, exercised over the, the content of local media and we've seen it uh, more broadly in the business community. So there is a real issue here and I'm struck by uh, the seriousness at least with which it seems to be viewed by people in this room. The next question is, um, is a follow-up. Um, 
as an Australian in Washington, which of course has pretty strict laws when it comes to foreign political donations. Uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, Americans are startled, frankly, that at least uh, up until now, uh, Australia doesn't have a law banning uh, foreign donations to our political parties. That, uh, that's in the process of changing this legislation uh, that, that's, that's been tabled in Parliament to address that. And uh, it seems pretty categorical here uh, that there's strong support for, for taking that step. And what's interesting to me is we're talking about two of the oldest uh, continuous democracies in the world. I think yours might even be the oldest. Um, and and uh, this is actually quite a profound change when you think about the consequences. Uh, you know, on this topic about Chinese influence activities or interference, um, I, I think when we when we talked, we talked about this quite extensively at our conference. And it, from a U.S. perspective, there's concern about this, and certainly, you know, the recent revelations about Australia and New Zealand have been gaining a lot of attention in Washington, and there's a lot of um, beginning to be a lot of, of consideration in the United States about similar activities, particularly at universities um, and other things. But even more pressing is the concern about Russia and Russia's influ influence in, uh, in our elections in 2016 and ongoing influence activities. And I think uh, there, was, there was discussion about, you know, this is a broad-based problem. It's really not just China and Russia. It's a lot of other countries as well. Um, that are really seeking to kind of exploit the vulnerabilities of democratic societies and the new, um, you know, the new platforms that are uh, provided by social media and other things. Um, and so, it was, I think you know, this is a kind of challenge to democracy that I, we really did not perceive five years ago, and now suddenly it's become uh, a quite a focused topic of discussion and concern about how can we make our dem you know, democracies like Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, others, I mean, how can we make our uh, UK, there's a lot of alleging that, the, a lot of people are alleging that Russia uh, was, was involved in the, in the Brexit vote as well, for example. So how can we make our institutions more resilient so that we can be more assured that the public debates and policy outcomes that flow from that um, the political and policy outcomes are determined by our own citizens based on our own conception of our interests and aspirations and values and not be manipulated. I just want to add one very quick point on this, which is that um, when we talk about Chinese political influence, really what we're talking about is Chinese Communist Party's influence. And I, I think we all have to you know, be very clear when we talk about this issue that what makes our democracy strong is that we are multicultural, right? And that's part of what is the strength in democracy uh, at its heart. And so when we worry about foreign influence, it's, it's not about individuals or ethnicities, of course. So I think we all, when we talk about this issue, we have to talk about specifically influence, not of, uh, of certain types of people, but of certain governments, right? Uh, in, in this case, non-representative governments. Um, and, and that's important, and we, I think we often do it, but we should just stress that uh, whenever we talk about these issues. All right, so um, the sixth question is, the largest threat to New Zealand's interests in Asia today um, are, uh, the overwhelming response here at 43% is regional instability. Uh, next was climate change at 26%. U.S. disengagement at 16 percent, North Korea's nuclear program, and China's rise uh, are, are the last two. I, I think this is a fascinating response. If you ask this question in the United States, I'm quite sure that the answer you would get would be almost the exact reverse of this. Uh, the top answer would probably be China, but it might be North Korea. It would certainly be one of those two. I bet the I bet those would account for 70% of the responses. The next response would probably be either U.S. disengagement or climate change, and then general regional instability would be somewhere way down the list. Um, so I, I think this is fascinating. This goes to some of the challenges we have as partners. In, in pushing forward, right? That there are areas where we're prioritizing different things. And I don't think that means that we want different outcomes. Um, 
outcomes. I think, in general, our people want the same outcomes, but the priority we're going to put on these issues is going to be quite different. Uh, and this is one of the real challenges I think we've got in the relationship, is how do we ensure that we're aligned and that we put effort uh, where as a partnership we can, we can uh, make the most uh, progress on, on some of these issues. Yeah, I, I agree this is interesting and I think maybe we should try to unpack it a bit in the discussion session, but, um, you know, it strikes me that, the um, you know, regional instability cut heights a multitude of sins in a way, doesn't it? Um, but, but when you look at, when you look at what's actually happening in the region, I think there's little doubt and, and this is the Washington view, um, that, that, um, China's uh, increasing power, partly but much more so, its assertiveness and the illiberal trajectory of its economic policies and its uh, domestic political system are a major um, cause of instability in the region. But I also suspect that some of this might be, some of the, the people who answered regional instability might be getting more at you know, fragile states, um, uh, pressures in the South Pacific and so forth. Uh, and maybe some of the issues in Southeast Asia where we're seeing uh, a bit of a sort of backsliding on democracy in a number of countries. So I think it'd be interesting to sort of unpack a little more uh, what people are driving at there. Okay, well, um, we have a few more questions, but I think um, what we might do now is provide you an opportunity actually to ask some questions rather than just exercise your, um, your, your choices through, through voting. So um, we have about, um, we have about 15 minutes or so, and so I'm going to open the floor. Can I just encourage people, if you, if you are going to, please ask a question rather than give a speech. Um, but uh, put my hand up there, please, imagine. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for That's fantastic. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thank you for a fascinating overview and uh, an interesting set of questions. I guess my question is uh, for Amy Seawright, uh, and I was... Um, I'm not sure how quite to put it. Struck is probably not the right word, but I was struck by the fact uh, that you mentioned on the U.S. side there is gender consensus that China is now a rival. Uh, so on, in that context, I was wondering: is there a sense in the U.S. as to how to respond to this new rival? Because my understanding as an outsider is that the military dimension is being emphasized with the pivot or with the rebalance, and the economic dimension with the TPP and so on is taking a backseat. And I'm not saying that the U.S. and China are in a cold war, but my understanding of the last great rivalry that the U.S. had was one on economic basis, and I don't see an economic basis in this competition, so to speak. Thank you. Look, that's an excellent question. I think you captured some uh, some some dilemmas really well. I, but what I would what I would point out is that the you know the Obama rebalance or pivot. Although the military side did get out perhaps ahead uh, faster than the economic side, but there was a, a TPP was a real pillar of the rebalance, and so the intention was always to get TPP over the finish line, and that was the economic strategy uh, to deal with a China that really was not playing fully fairly in terms of opening its market, um, adhering to rules. Uh, that would allow you know, commercial uh, imperatives to drive outcomes rather than these state-directed outcomes. So, um, so there was an attention there. Now, in the Trump era, under Trump, you know, obviously he withdrew from TPP. He has not replaced the economic pillar of the rebalance with anything that is really compelling or viable, you know, appealing to countries in the region. So I agree with you. I think you know, under Trump, the United States has really sort of advocated um, economic leadership in the region. Um, now he has instituted, uh, you know, these these uh, trade policies towards China, um, tariffs, and uh, some tough measures. Um, this was expected, and frankly, I think it's quite likely that under a different administration, a Democratic administration under Hillary Clinton, for example, or um, you would have seen something similar. Because as I mentioned, the business community was, was growing increasingly frustrated with China. And so there was a growing consensus that something had to be done to, to force China, to really try to push China 
to make some changes, to make, to make sh otherwise we will soon be living in a world where there will be no American businesses, uh, firms, you know, really operating in China, and they, they will be shutting out all kind of American technology and innovation and, and investment. So there's a consensus about that. Um, the way Trump has gone about it, however, is not necessarily the smartest way because um, he, you know, there's not been a real attempt to bring others on board in this effort. You know, if you're going to go after, if you're going to try to really go after China and try to find ways to um, change China's behavior, it would make sense to get a lot of your friends and partners, you know, your economic allies on board. TPP would be one way, but another way would be just to be really coordinating a, a, a joint approach through the WTO or some other uh, ways to make sure that it's not just, you know, America alone going after China and having all of this also um, uh, uh, collateral damage to allies, friends, and partners. So it's it's so the way Trump is going about it is not very smart, but I think it does it does reflect the consensus that I was talking about. Could I just a very quick sort of add on to that? Um, I TPP, the TPP decision was completely stupid, and I think a lot of the administration uh, actually knows that, and my sense is they're looking for a way to dig out from a hole that they've created for themselves. Um, you know, it was, um, it was a really bad stumble, obviously, self-inflicted. Um, I think it's really important, though, um, not to conflate TPP with actual trade and investment and innovation. And the United States remains a huge economic presence in the region. Um, investment-wise, in terms of driving innovation, technology, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and trade. And regrettable as um, these measures are, my own view is that they're a necessary correction, uh, and that the system had become unsustainable, and that China um, misappropriating thirty billion dollars of American intellectual property every year while also looking to export to the United States half a trillion dollars of goods is not a sustainable future for the world trading system. Um, but I totally agree with Amy's point about, uh, about the response. And I think governments, uh, whether the US government or other Western governments, believers in free trade have kind of dropped the ball here. We've stopped explaining to people why it matters. We haven't really made the case effectively to our domestic constituencies, and now we're paying a price in this kind of backlash in this moment of deglobalisation. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I've got a um, gentleman up there. Cool. To each of the panelists, Russia or China, who is the bigger threat to the American led world order, and why? Oh, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, so so my personal view is that, that if you ask most Americans, the answer is going to be China. Um, the reason is that Russia is, you know, barely holding on to one of the tenth largest economies in the world. I think they're technically number seven right now, but they're getting passed pretty quickly. Um, Russia is not a challenger to the global order. Um, it's a fairly weak state next to the European Union, which has a whole series of countries that are more powerful than Russia in those dimensions. And that is not to discount what the Russians have been doing, right? Uh, the fact that they're uh, assassinating individuals in friendly countries, uh, the count collectings, the fact that they clearly have interfered in the US elections and continue to interfere in our political system, I, I don't want to minimize that as a, as a concern. My only point is we can manage that. Um, I, I think China in the long term is, is the one that we have to pay attention to. And it's the real reason, as Amy said, is that the way Americans have thought about China for the last 20 years is that we wanted to make China a responsible stakeholder in the system. And the belief was that if we engaged and integrated China into the order, that not only would China's external behavior change, but China's internal nature would change as well. Right? It would become more open, less repressive, and actually what we've seen as China has gotten stronger is it's become more repressive and more assertive at the same time internationally. I think that's the real challenge. My personal view is that you know, the, the Russian challenge is going to be a, a real concern. It's something we have to pay attention to. Um, but it's something that, that we can manage with pretty limited resources if needed. 
Just a quick add on to that. Um, I agree with, with Zach. Um, there, when I was in the Pentagon uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a pretty lively debate about this among military planners and experts. Um, you know, what, what was the biggest threat facing us? Was it Russia or was it China? Um, and a lot of it depended on well, really two things. First was, you know, uh, which theater was the military planner focused on? Uh, you know, was, was, it, was it, were they based in PACOM or the Pacific Command? Or were they based in uh, Central Command, for example? Um, and the other was how, when, how you view the threat. If, 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 it's a, if you're thinking about what is the biggest threat or concern to the long-term strategic interests of the United States, then that leads you to really be concerned about China. If the, if the question is, what, you, what is the, what's the biggest threat to U.S. Um, uh, military forces and, and strategic interests in the, in the short term, and who, is, who seems to be most eager to do damage to the United States in provocative ways that could be quite risky and lead perhaps to an unintended conflict, um, that's Russia. So it's sort of the short term versus the long term, but I think when when the debate was fully hashed out, I think you see this in the national defense strategy. I think the consensus did shift a little bit from what was more of an, uh, an, an from my perspective, was sort of an even evenly split debate to one that that did recognize that there should be more of a focus on the long term, broader strategic threat. And for all the reasons that Zach said, that's really not Russia because Russia in 10 years is probably going to be less, much less powerful than it is now. Um, Go ahead, just one quick footnote, nuclear weapons. I, I mean, I, I agree with both of my colleagues, but, but um, uh, Putin's preparedness to threaten the use of nuclear weapons is a, is a profoundly destabilizing and, and relatively new uh, development. His, uh, his reinvestment in Russia's uh, strategic weapons is is not to be ignored. So, I, so in the longer term, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, Russia is dying out demographically. Its power is much narrower. It's basically about its covert uh, intelligence uh, muscle, its cyber muscle, and its nuclear weapons. But I think that we are unfortunately seeing the return of nuclear weapons to to front and centre in global security, and that should trouble us. Thank you, David. On the question about the country that will have the most power in the next 10 years, you all expressed surprise that uh, the audience didn't say the United States. Um, but why have you not actually factored in what I guess we see from here as the squandering of American power ever since the invasion of Iraq? Um, and the constitutional chaos of the United States at the moment. I mean, to posture in 10 years' time that the United States will be more powerful than it is now. Seemingly a very open question, be precisely because to be the most powerful country, you actually have to have the political will and the political capacity to exercise power. And I think a lot of us in this part of the world feel that there's some doubt about that. I'm just going to take that one first because I am writing a book for this. Uh, so uh, so I, I agree with everything you said. I, I think my expectation, if you, you know, if I answer that question, is that China in Asia will probably be more powerful than the United States in 10 years. Um, what surprises me is that often what you see from people when they look at those power shifts is they, uh, they recognize the power shifts lower than they're actually occurring. So the expectation that I have is that uh, the power will shift, but it will take quite a long time for people to actually recognize that the power has changed. And so what, what's interesting here is that you're actually seeing people sort of lead where they think China's going to go, not, not where it is. And that's very uh, surprising historically. If you, if you look back at other cases of rising powers, it actually takes people a long time to realize that they're stronger than the powers that they're replacing. So I'll give you one example. Uh, by most metrics of, of power, the point at which the United States surpassed uh, the United Kingdom uh, in or Great Britain in, in most measures of power was the mid-1880s. I, I bet you, if you actually were to ask people, if you polled on this question, 
1910, still people would have said, you know, it came from this far stronger, I think. Maybe even through the end of the second. Right. So, so the, usually the expectations really uh, are, are quite lagging on this question. And here, we don't see that. So that's what I find interesting. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, just very quickly, first of all, I didn't mean to imply that we were surprised that China was the was the dominant choice. Um, I think we were. I was surprised that um, at the relative dominance, <laughs> uh, because as we said, you know, when we've done this elsewhere, we've seen a lot more uh, distribution of of the out of the choices, including the U.S. being the most powerful, and the and the for the U.S. to be the most powerful doesn't mean that the U.S. would get more powerful. I think we all would agree that the United States is, a, relatively speaking, a declining power. You know, it's declining in relative terms. But the question was, who's going to be the most powerful country in Asia? So the United States could still, hypothetically, continue to decline, relatively speaking, quite a bit as China rises, relatively speaking. But it depends on where you think that crossing over threshold is, where that you know where those trajectories are. Um, and to your point on uh, on you know, where the you know, self-inflicted wounds that the United States has been making, such as withdrawing from TPP, you know, we've already talked about a lot of other things. Um, again, I don't think you'll get any disagreement here. And I think that the, it's, it, there is uncertainty about, about how much the United States is going to squander its power, as you put it. But there's also uncertainty about China, and, you know, both economic uncertainty and uh, whether China will overreach and do things that will actually um, limit or degrade its influence in the region, um, as we've seen some of the debates in Australia and New Zealand, for example, um, show that, that you know China is prone to overreaching, um, and that can produce some backlash. Just a quick historical observation as a non-American. Um, America is a very different society from New Zealand and Australia. We are sort of placid and incremental, and America is big and volatile and explosive. And if you look through American history, every 50 or 60 years, there's a massive convulsion, economic, political, religious, cultural, social. Um, and um, I think we are going through one of those convulsions uh, in American history now. I'm not saying it's all plain sailing, I'm not saying that, you know, it'll all go back to exactly where it was, because each time it does this, it comes out as a slightly different country, uh, but still a recognisable country. But I do think that that sort of explosiveness is quite hard for, for us to understand from outside America. And, but it is important to bear in mind this kind of cycle, because America went through a terrible period in the mid-60s, it went through a terrible period in the 30s, it went through a terrible period after the Civil War, and, um, and the revolutionary period was pretty untidy too. Messy, argumentative, hyper-partisan, there's nothing new. Um, what do you see as the role of China's and what do you see as the role of China's one build one word policy in altering the balance of power? Um, well, I, I lead the Southeast Asia program at CSIS, so I, I focus quite a bit on uh, Belt and Road and what it means for the region, how countries are reacting to it. Um, I, you know, I think, look, China is, is, is putting for, together a very ambitious, long-term strategic plan um, that, that's putting a lot of resources towards and a lot of diplomatic effort. Um, and it's, it's put together a really compelling narrative as well that has both kind of the soft power element to it of, of real appeal of connectivity um, and boosting trade and, and, and connections um, uh, throughout Eurasia. Um, and also has a little bit of um, what I've started to be using the phrase that Walter Russell Mead coined of sticky power, meaning that, uh, you know, it, it's a sort of like a carnivorous plant that opens up with this beautiful fragrance and lures you in, and before you know it, you know, you are stuck in a relationship that you can't extricate your, yourself from. And when you think of Sri Lanka and the kind of loans that Sri Lanka took on that it was not able to pay off, and so it basically had to lease 99-year 
uh, you know, give a 99 year lease to China for, for its pork um, and other facilities. You know, that's the kind of, um, you know, it, it, that's the kind of strings attached uh, 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 aspect to Belt and Road that countries in the region are increasingly cognizant of and concerned about. But I think we're just going to have to wait and see how it plays out. I will say that, you know, I think there are a lot of negative aspects to Chinese investment in infrastructure development, the lack of high of, of environmental and social safeguards, the, the lack of responsible lending, the bringing in of Chinese workers that, you know, cut and, and businesses that cut out the, the ability for the local economy and workers to benefit. Um, but China is also adapting a lot as, along the way. And so I think if there are, if countries start to get very, um, concerned about those things and push back on those kinds of things, you know, China may well adapt. So I think it's one of these unpredictable things where I think China is setting itself up for a kind of grand Marshall Plan, or maybe it's even grander than the Marshall Plan kind of approach to really solidify its position in the region. And it may well, it may well work. We've got time, got two hands up. So what I think I might do is take those two questions together and put them to the panelists and you can um, uh, d divide them as you like. Uh, Tim, take And then Pete. Uh, so my question is for Zach. Um, it is, do you think there's any benefit in New Zealand being more vocal or obvious in our policy criticisms of the US? And uh, how might we do this? And would it make a difference? <laughs> Tim? Um, Peter. Um, Peter Nichols, my question might be outside the scope of this, but I'd be really intrigued to hear your answer. If we were to take the question and delete New Zealand and insert China, what do you think China's answers might be? So the question would be, is the largest threat to China's interests in Asia today? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with some quick responses on that. But let me take the, the second question first. So we've asked some of these questions of Chinese friends, and I think the results are largely what you would expect, with, it, with a couple of exceptions. So um, one exception is that when you ask Chinese which country is going to be the most powerful in 10 years, they're much more pessimistic about China than you would expect. So far fewer Chinese think that China is going to be stronger than the United States, than New Zealanders. So I, I think, you know, that tells you something about what's going on in China right now. And, and you know, we, I think it's easy to assume that um, Xi Jinping is centralizing power, and that means that China and Xi is very strong. But we have to remember that actually the reason he's centralizing power is in part because there's some severe weaknesses and fragility in the Chinese system, and the Chinese people see that. Um, so that, I think, explains part of that response. I, I, you know, I, I think when you ask the Chinese what they're worried about, in, in large part, it's the United States. And I can't blame them, right? I mean, at the moment, uh, the US is taking a pretty hard-line stance. Uh, it doesn't seem like there are a lot of areas for cooperation. Um, and, and so I, I think that's a couple of the responses you get. Um, the question of how to criticize the United States. Uh, you know, as an American coming to a friendly country and then asking you to tell us uh, what we can do better, this is a touchy subject. Uh, but I, I would say two things. The first is uh, often when you need to say, have these difficult discussions, I think it's best to have them behind closed doors. And I think that's, you know, a perfectly good and reasonable thing to do. And that's, you know, what our different match are there for to convey these messages so that we understand where where both countries are coming from. But I think it's also important when uh, your officials get asked tough questions that they be open and honest about how New Zealanders feel about things that are happening in our country. Um, and I think you, it, it may be hard to see it reflected here, but I, I think we listen. Um, when friends abroad are concerned about the direction that we're headed, um, you know, the American people, we hear some of that. And, and little by little, it changes opinions and it causes people to think twice about some of the things they're doing. And, um, you know, it's not going to work quickly. It won't always be effective. But I think those quiet conversations are important. And, and when you think something's really important, speaking out on that is, is critical as well. 
Yeah, see the bird in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the, the your question about the question about the China, how China perceives threats is really interesting. Uh, I worked at the Lowy Institute in Sydney, and about six or seven years ago now, we polled uh, inside China on this question. Absolutely fascinating results. They've probably changed a little, but I suspect the core of them uh, would would hold up. And that is that uh, among older cohorts of Chinese who had lived through the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward, overwhelmingly they saw the threats to China as internal and environmental, uh, water quality, air quality, uh, food, basically their their families' health and safety. When we poll uh, younger cohorts, <coughs> startlingly or strikingly, uh, they were much more likely to say the United States, Japan, um, uh, etc. Entangling, you know, encircling alliances, all of those sorts of things. And that, to me, was kind of counterintuitive. You'd think that younger people were more outward looking and more kind of cosmopolitan, more likely to, to have travelled, etc., etc. I think that's true. So what explains the difference? Uh, and this is why I'm, I'm concerned. The difference is uh, at least one generation of Chinese who have been through uh, indoctrination, through the education system. And I'm concerned about the current illiberal trend in uh, Xi Jinping's China, precisely because as the Communist Party strengthens its control over opinion through social media and everything else, I think we're going to see more of this angular nationalism and uh, I worry about that particularly if the Chinese economy starts to slow down uh, faster than it, it, it's already slowing down or abruptly if there's some kind of economic crisis because the only remaining source of legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party in those circumstances uh, is nationalism. Quickly on the question that was asked of Zach, I, I, I think I disagree a little bit with Zach on this. I think um, that the best way that New Zealand can express um, concern or disagreement with the United States is to take action in a way that um, really signals that New Zealand is going to continue to work with other like-minded countries to uphold the values that we all hold dear. So TPP 11 is the perfect example of that, to go launch TPP without the United States and leave the door open for the United States to join in the future. But there are a lot of other areas that you could think about doing. For example, if the Trump administration is not going to trumpet human rights and democratic norms, New Zealand could raise its voice even more, working with Australia, Japan, other countries in regional fora or elsewhere to really make clear that, you know, hey, even if the Trump, even if the United States is temporarily absent, we're going to uphold this. Um, these norms and these principles. So I would just throw that out there. And then on the China question, I think, you know, it depends on who you poll. So Andrew's talking about polling citizens, but if you poll the 19th Party Congress, um, what the largest threat to China's interests in Asia today is the United States. And it's not United States disengagement, it's United States engagement. And I mean, there's no, there's no secret here. I don't read Chinese, I don't speak or read Chinese, but my friends who do tell me that it's pretty, it's been kind of written and written pretty clearly in a lot of documents that, uh, you know, that China views U.S. preeminence in Asia and, that, and the U.S. alliance system as its major threat. And it, you know, Xi Jinping has given plenty of speeches on the future of the Asia security order that China envisions that distinctly has the United States not very present in that order, you know, Asia security for Asians, all that stuff. It's not, I mean, this is, this is not a secret. It's actually quite out in the open if you just look for it. So I would just end on that, Shereen. You know. Well, thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions, but um, just in closing, we say that um, the, the meeting that we've been at over the last day and a half, I think probably yeah, all, all four of us get to go to be hundreds, certainly tens and tens of meetings each year, uh, many of which you go into having a pretty clear sense of what you're going to hear. They're very predictable and, and almost somewhat choreographed. And, and I think one of the things that was tremendously valuable about the discussions that we've had over the last, last couple of days was just 
how free and frank and open they were and how they gave us a sense of um, some shared interests and shared perspectives, but also some pretty striking differences in perspective. Uh, and I think those have been uh, ably summed up by our, um, our three participants from CSIS uh, uh, this evening. It's a really fascinating and sobering time. Um, but one of the things that gives us hope is that we are able to have these kind of conversations and that they can be so, so free and, and open and robust. And uh, on that note, I would encourage and I hope you can all join us next door in the common room where we can carry on some of these conversations, including with our, with our guests, over a glass of wine and, and some refreshments. But uh, please join with me, if you will, in thanking uh, Zach, Amy and Andrew for their presentations.